Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's lecture. I'm Claire Annesley. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture here at UNSW. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming on this warm and windy, uh, almost spring evening, and I'd like to acknowledge that as we meet here today on the Kensington campus of UNSW, we're meeting on the traditional land of the Bidjigal people of the Aura Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are joining us here for this lecture tonight. So we're here for the Utzon lecture series. It's a series of lectures that celebrates the diverse and impactful voices of those who are improving built environments here in Australia, but globally around the world. And tonight it's the Jean Wilsford lecture. And that honors pioneering, the pioneering female architect Jean Wilsford, who worked for decades on public housing projects and public buildings. And we are especially delighted to welcome Jean's daughter, Anne Wilsford, to UNSW tonight. And I hope you will in, um, join me in um, thanking the Wilsford family for their support in making this happen. Anne is sitting just at the front here. And I particularly love this lecture in the Utzon Lecture series because as a, an academic, my background is working on politics and policy and gender. And so for me, it's a real joy and a privilege to um, see how Jean's generous donation supports UNSW to invite eminent female speakers to join us um, for this annual lecture in her name. Um, now, you might wonder why there's <laughs> a picture behind us of, of um, some guys. That's Pierre Trudeau and his cabinet, um, one of the uh, Canadian prime ministers from the 1960s. And that's up there because my research is particularly about um, how we get more women into politics, how we get more women um, appointed to cabinet positions, appointed as ministers, and then also, what difference do those women make when they have the opportunity to exercise executive power? And so, for me, it's also tonight a great honor to be able to welcome our speaker. Um, the Utzon address tonight will be delivered by the Honorable Rose Jackson. And Rose, um, as many of you will know, is um, a Labour Minister for the New South Wales Legislative Council and Minister for Mental Health, Housing, Homelessness, Youth, Water and the North Coast. She was elected to the Le Legislative Council in May 2019 and has been fighting for real action on climate change and tackling homelessness and housing affordability since she got elected. And she's also held various roles within the Labour and Union movement, including Assistant Secretary of New South Wales Labour and as an official for United Voice. She lives with her family in Rockdale and um, is somebody who is passionate about, but not just passionate about, you know, does something about making our society fairer for everyone. And tonight's lecture is extra special because following Rose's keynote, We've got four eminent female speakers here tonight who will um, join us here on stage for um, a panel discussion, discussion on housing as critical infrastructure. So let me just quickly introduce you to who will be up on stage in a little while after um, Rose's address. First up is going to be chaired by Lucy Turnbull, AO, who, again, we many of us in this room will know is a eminent urbanist, businesswoman, and philanthropist with a long-standing interest in cities, culture, technological and social innovation, and Australian research and commercialization. Lucy's director of Turnbull and Partners, which is her family-owned business, which invests in earlier stage innovative enterprises. And Lucy was also um, the inaugural chief commissioner of the Greater City Commission, which was 
that organisation tasked by the UN, um, New South Wales State Government to assist in delivering strong and effective strategic planning for the whole of metropolitan Sydney. And then 2003-2004, she was Lord Mayor of the City of Sydney and the first woman to ever hold that position. And then joining um, Lucy on, and Rose on the panel tonight are Elle Davidson, Hazel Easthope and Olivia Hyde. So let me just introduce you to those wonderful colleagues as well. Elle, David, Elle Davidson is a Balangara woman from East Kimberley and an Aboriginal planning lecturer at the University of Sydney. She's passionate about empowering um, the voices of First Nations people and combines town planning and Indigenous engagement qualifications and skills to facilitate a co-design process that leads to culturally informed outcomes. And with a focus on community outcomes, Elle now works with her clients through Zion Engagement and Planning to develop bespoke engagement plans and assist in building relationships with community. Hazel Easthope is one of my colleagues here at UNSW. She is director, sorry, deputy director of the City Futures Research Centre here in the Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture. She's got qualifications in sociology and human geography and researches in the areas of urban studies and housing. And she's got a particular research interest in residential satisfaction and the intersections between mobility, identity, and home. And much of her research focuses on the development, management, governance, and planning implications of private apartment buildings and estates and the lived experience of their residents. And then finally, Olivia Hyde is director of Design Excellence at, Gov um, Design Excellence at Government Architects New South Wales, where she leads the development of policies and programs to support and promote greater design quality in the built environment across the state. She has a diverse private sector experience, leading award-winning local and international projects. She's a registered architect and a life fellow of the Australian Institute of Architects. And then to wrap up, at the end of all that, we get to hear from another of my colleagues, Hannah Bol um, Bolitho, who's an architect and urban designer and manager of strategy at our Cities Institute, um, one of the um, entities who has brought together tonight's event. So thank you, Hannah, for bringing these incredible group of speakers and panelists together. And um, Hannah's gonna wrap up by talking about the role of academia in all of these issues that are gonna be discussed in the panel. So that's a pretty amazing lineup for um, this evening. Uh, my job now is to get off stage and, um, but first to um, introduce the keynote speaker of the 2024 Jean Wilsford Utzon Lecture, addressing the issue of housing as critical infrastructure. I welcome the Honourable Rose Jackson. Over to you. Thank, you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Claire. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting um, and pay respect um, to elders past and present and extend that respect and acknowledgement to any Aboriginal people joining us um, for this lecture this evening. So I've taken as the theme of my uh, comments um, before we get into the panel discussion, what is housing? And as the New South Wales Minister for Housing for 18 months now, you may be forgiven that uh, for thinking that I probably should have figured that out by now. And I suppose it's mildly problematic if I don't know. But as the Minister for Housing, I'm posing the question, what is housing? Because I think the way that you answer that question is fundamental to the way that you approach that role. Is housing a commodity? Is it an investment? Is it shelter? Is it a physical structure, a house? Is it a social construct, a home? Do we go beyond the home, the space in between the house, the garden, the street, the community created? Does it invoke or involve in your mind a physical manifestation, 
walls and doors and windows? Or does it encompass something else in your heart, non-physical things like connections between neighbours and the feeling when you walk in a door or when you walk down a street and the social bonds made and unmade by the way we conceive of and deliver housing? Do we see housing as an entitlement, as a right or as a reward for hard work or for those deserving? These aren't just word plays or abstract mental games. These fundamental and foundational questions that ministers for housing face need to be considered in developing frameworks that guide public policy decisions. The assumptions about what housing is and what purpose it serves obviously and evidently guide the way that we design policy responses to support access to it. So perhaps we should refine a little bit more from the very conceptual chin stroker, what is housing, to the more specific challenge for us in the real world, as real people, at a real university, trying to solve real problems. What is the purpose of housing policy? What is the problem we are trying to solve? Well, what is housing? To me, it's a basic necessity. I accept housing as a first order need in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Shelter sits alongside breathing and eating and sleeping as a foundational physiological requirement. And accepting this guides policy responses. We have housing policy and housing ministers to ensure access to the basic right. That's the job, to facilitate people having their core requirements for life met. For me, that seems like a pretty good place to start. Interestingly, of course, housing sits a little bit separately from other core requirements in this regard. We don't have ministers for breathing, or ministers for food, or ministers for sleeping, although sometimes I wish we did. We just assume that these things occur or exist. And I think the disagreement in the public policy discourse over the question, well, what is housing, has contributed to it requiring its own portfolio, its own budget, or lack thereof sometimes, its own department. Because sleeping and breathing basically look the same to all people. Now, sure, we have back sleepers and stomach sleepers and weird L-shaped sleepers like me and sweet tooths and vegans and meat eaters, but fundamentally, having a nap or food in mouth basically doesn't change. And it's fair to assume, excluding, of course, people with very specific medical needs, that it just happens. Well, we can't assume that housing just happens. Everyone in this room knows that. My kids know that. Homelessness is everywhere. It's all around us, from the very obvious rough sleeping to the hidden chronic housing instability, and they're not just numbers and statistics this year's street count data or the latest census count, these are real people fleeing family violence, evicted from their rental, young people struggling with couch surfing or another dodgy overcrowded share house, elderly women living in cars or worse. It's easy to be desensitized. But let's bring it back to basics. Thousands and thousands of people in our society living around us every day are failed so badly that their basic needs are not being met. Needs as basic as eating and breathing and sleeping. In such circumstances, we may not need a minister for breathing, but we absolutely need a dedicated minister for housing. And as I've said, how that person defines housing and what they consider the purpose of their role fundamentally shapes their approach. So here is my framework. My job is not to admire problems or pose thoughtful philosophical questions. It's to answer them and be accountable for decisions about how policy is designed and delivered. I've tried to keep it simple because I want to be able to de deliver my pitch on what housing is and what the purpose of my efforts as the Minister for Housing are as clearly and straightforwardly as possible. Housing is more than a roof over our heads. It is the foundation on which our lives are built. And when we ensure everyone has access to safe and affordable housing, we create a society in which we all can thrive. We lay the foundation for opportunity. This frame is important because in a society in which pressures on individual and government budgets are immense, taxpayers understandably ask, why should my money 
go to provide housing for others? It's actually not an unreasonable question, but there is a completely reasonable answer. The answer involves moving beyond conceptualising spending money on social housing as a form of state-sponsored charity, a nice thing to do for sure, but the benefit is for another, for the individual tenant. Good for them, but that's about it. Now, for some of our non-government charitable and faith-based partners, the service mission is core to their purpose in supporting social housing, and that's really important for them. And we welcome a partnership with benevolent-minded organisations using their time and capital and energy to support the delivery of social housing because they think it is the good and just thing to do. They are great people and great organisations. But that is not government. A paternalistic attitude on behalf of government that would see such expenditure as charity fundamentally misunderstands the role of housing policy in a mature modern democracy. We must see spending money on social housing as an investment. It benefits all of us and delivers broader public value. Its purpose is not to give the taxpayer the important and well-deserved feeling of warmth inside that giving charity gives to a donor. We are not investing money in social housing to make taxpayers or ourselves feel nice inside. We're doing it because our entire society rests on the fundamental premise that our form of democracy can meet basic needs. Because if that's not true, we are in a dark and dangerous place. When we invest in social housing, we are investing in the well-being of our entire society. It's not just about offering shelter to the needy. It's about creating spaces that increase economic growth and development, promote public safety and cohesion, support sustainable budgeting in other areas, such as health and law and order. Overall, it makes our society fairer, safer, wealthier, more dynamic, and a more rewarding place for everybody to live. I believe we should not view social housing as a government version of the poor box, where we might charitably drop a few dollars in every few years, but a vital strategic investment in our social infrastructure. The answer to the question of the shrewd taxpayer legitimately demanding answers on how we're spending their hard-earned dollars is that this particular line, budget line item is nothing less than an opportunity to build communities in which everyone can thrive and have a sense of belonging. Now, does that sound a bit highfalutin and cliched? Maybe, but think of the alternative, a society in which an increasingly large number of people are unable to have basic needs met and respond variously with anger, reaching for political extremes, looking for someone to blame, so much potential talent and energy lost to addiction or prison or a park bench or an early grave. And if you think that's over the top, look at the result of every single research study ever done on the economic, social and physical impacts of homelessness and housing insecurity. Now, to be fair to our good friend, the doubtful taxpayer, there are things government needs to do to make this vision work and that we should be held accountable for. The first is beautiful design. Social housing has got to stop being a blight on our streets. We should live in places with beautiful things and they shouldn't just be opera houses on glittering harbours, although many thanks to Utsun for showing us what's possible with vision and ambition. We can have things of beauty and vision and ambition on all our streets and tucked away in every suburb. Government designed and delivered buildings can and should be the most attractive, most sustainable and most accessible. We can be leaders and standard setters and use the scale of our public housing delivery programs to build beautiful, lasting homes for, uh, that shape our future cities. And taxpayers should demand nothing less for their investment. On top of beautiful design, another important thing government can do is view housing beyond the physical dwelling, beyond the bricks and mortar, beautiful though it may be. We must invest in the people and the connections between them. Education, health services, mental health, cultural facilities, employment opportunities. We must recognise that these things are just as important as the number of homes we're building. We're building spaces that deliver on the promise of changing lives and providing opportunity. 
Taxpayers should rightfully demand the dollars that we are spending on building communities are not just invested in building the homes, but are invested in such a way that they save money in other areas. A good investment yields a good return. And done right, investing in social housing absolutely can. Finally, governments should be planning not for just beautiful homes and supporting the people who live in them, but beautifully planned communities and thinking about how to make them work, moving beyond X many houses and Y many dwellings to talk about new neighbourhoods and how they will function and feel. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with our estate renewal projects, such as Waterloo South, and government-led rezonings in transport-oriented development precincts, adopting principles of inclusive growth with transport, social infrastructure, and affordable housing included as core elements. These things should be done well and from the beginning, not thrown together last minute or haphazardly bolted on when we realise how much we've missed. Taxpayers have already funded the transport infrastructure in most of these areas to the tune of billions of dollars, so it's only reasonable that they reap the benefits of properly planned and designed communities around them. Well-designed, beautiful, sustainable buildings, people supported not just with a house, but to create a home, thoughtfully planned and inclusive communities. These are critical to building the communities of opportunity that social housing can create. This is not a story we have been telling in recent years. In New South Wales, we have seen decades of underinvestment in social housing. Overall, numbers have declined, both in real terms and as a percentage of total housing stock. And why? Different answers were given to those fundamental questions. As I said, the way you view housing and what you see the purpose of housing policy shapes the outcome you deliver. If you see social housing as desperate last resort accommodation, something you should do to help the deserving poor, then it's easy for it to be squeezed and minimised and deprioritised in tough budgetary environments. It's not a need to have, it's a nice to have, and add to that the marginalisation of some people who live in social housing as undeserving leads to obvious questions about why precious taxpayer dollars should be spent on providing homes for people who couldn't or wouldn't provide for themselves. Forgetting perhaps that social housing tenants do provide for themselves. They pay rent, in fact contributing over $800 million a year to the state budget but also forgetting that housing should not be seen as a reward or an optional extra. It's essential investment, a down payment on future growth and the success of our community. Fundamentally, the shift from a charitable framework to an investment framework leads to a completely different outcome. Delivered right, this framework has the ben uh, benefits not just the hundreds of thousands of individuals who rely on social housing, but every single one of us who wants to live in a stable, functional, dynamic society. Because as the Minister for Housing, it's not just building houses, although certainly I am very determined to do plenty of that, it's building communities of opportunity. I met a man who lived in public housing in Riverwood recently. He was a refugee from Vietnam, arrived here with nothing but the clothes, of his, on, the clothes on his back, one of those migrant stories that define multicultural Australia. He had nothing but was able to secure a government home in the suburbs of Sydney. This man proudly told me with tears in his eyes how every single one of his three children was now a qualified doctor, making a massive contribution to the place they now call home. Now look, this man obviously highly valued the opportunity of education, but that's the difference social housing can make in one generation. When public housing is poorly built, under-invested in and without support services to ensure kids are getting their chance, these stories are more accident than design. But viewed as an investment, public housing can be the crucible for generations of young people destined to live awesome lives out of the incubator of a house, properly defined. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Minister. Now, I'd like to welcome up to the stage the people whose, whose um, description you had earlier from Claire. Um, I'm just going to go down the list. Olivia Hyde, please, D Director of Design Excellence at the New South Wales Government Architect. Um, Elle Davidson, Director at Zion Engagement and Planning. Thank you, Elle. And Hazel Easthope, uh, um, Associate Director at UNSW City Futures Research Centre. Thank you, Hazel. And Hannah Belitho, Manager Strategy at UNSW City Institute. Hannah, please, Hannah. Okay, okay. Discussion and just a, a, a brief question from me. There is so much publicly owned, state government owned land all around Sydney, which I know more about than anywhere else. I don't know so much about regional New South Wales. How do you think over the last, say, 20 years, the governments of different hues and persuasions have actually gone at optimising the delivery of homes or housing for the people of New South Wales? I think it's been a mixed bag to be honest. Um, I mean, my reflection coming into government was that certainly over the last period um, of the previous government, approach to the utilisation of government land to deliver broad public benefit was pretty haphazard. There were a few examples of, of it being done well and a little bit of vision and ambition, but overall limited coherent strategy. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that we did the land audit and are trying to move to a coherent whole of government pipeline to activate public land for public benefit. Um, and so, and some of that is building on a little bit of preliminary work. I mean, I mentioned Waterloo South, you know, that is building on some of the concepts and design of the past. And we've recently announced 500 homes at the clothing store at North Everly, again, part of that matrix. But th those, as I said, I mean, it's another probable example of accident rather than design, a few good projects but not a coherent plan. So we have been trying to make it more coherent um, and, and I think that is working well, although I will say um, we are still bumping up against a culture of um, agency sort of uh, defensiveness of their land asset. Land is so valuable in Sydney and that is true for individual landowners but also for government landowners. And so it is a project, mm -hmm. I will say, to get our friends in transport and health and education to realise that land that they aren't using, that's just sitting there, could really be put to a great purpose. Um, and look, progress is being made, but it is a, it is a cultural shift within government, uh, uh, definitely. It really is. Um, I can give you lots of examples around Redfern Waterloo where that's very much the case. Now, um, Olivia, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, you have, the GAO has just launched its pattern book um, for housing for housing in, in New South Wales, which is a terrific innovation and it would have been great to have one in the last 10 or 15 years to speed up a clarity of purpose and outcome that governments and communities and developers could work with. Um, tell us a little bit about that and tell us about the process for getting to that pattern book. Thanks, Lucy. So, well, just to clarify, we haven't launched the actual pattern book yet, but we oh. are busy working away on it. Um, what did get launched recently was the international competition for designs for the pattern book. But essentially, we're, we've got several streams to develop up patterns and they are going to be for low and mid-rise development. So low being two storeys, that could be terrace houses or small apartment buildings and then mid-rise being um, four to six storeys or three to six storeys. And the intention there is that you'll be able to choose a pattern that you like um, online, you can switch left or right. Um, you'll be able to establish whether that fits to your site, whether you're a homeowner or a, a smaller scale developer. And the patterns will be developed with our very, very best architects and we're working with local architects at the, the international competition. We're hoping to source some great international inspiration but very much focusing on our local talent, which we personally very much believe in. 
Um, and they'll be developed so that they're absolutely buildable, they're sustainable, they're modest, but they're really well designed, to your point about design. And what we really hope is that they will, you know, become models that people love and really want to see on their streets. So um, great design, uh, a speeded up planning approval process, um, buildability and scalability. Mm -hmm. So um, we're really excited about it, actually. It's a great project and we've got, we're already working with some fantastic designers. Yeah. I've been in places where um, local governments don't really know what they want people to do and developers tear their hair out because they don't have any guides to what the, the local government wants. So actually having a Just tell me what is to a do. brilliant breakthrough in making the pathway to housing delivery simpler. So that's great. Um, now, um, Hazel, sh Hazel, um, should we be looking to countries for, for our model for creating new housing? where there are more renters or owner occupiers or, you know, what sort of housing model should we look at? I know that Singapore has 91% of its housing is owner occupied housing, which is an incredible, incredible um, uh, result after, you know, st they've stuck with the same principle since 1965 when the country was established and was Lee Kuan Yew's dream to give everybody a home and to build a garden in a city. And he's done, well, he, stopped a long time ago now, probably 50 or whatever years ago, but but he, there's been a consistency of that vision through time. And I know we were talking earlier about Germany where there's a very high rate of rental accommodation in other places in Europe and everybody's pretty comfortable with that. Where, what direction do you think we should be trying to, to go in? I think uh, the devil is in the detail um, in answering that. So, I mean, the question is, should we have a different um, breakdown of owner occupation and rental and maybe different kinds of rental? In the Singapore case you gave, um, most owner occupied housing in Singapore is actually government housing. Um, so it's developed by government and then sold for owner occupation. Um, in Germany, it's quite different. So in Germany, more than half of the population live in rental housing. And in fact, a large proportion of rental housing in Germany is private rental housing. And a lot of that is mum and dad owned rental housing. Um, so more similar to the Australian case, we have about 30%, a, a third renting here. We can certainly look to other countries to learn how to do renting better here. Um, we don't do it particularly well when we compare ourselves on the international stage. I mean, you look to Germany, which as I said, has a, um, many renters, many private renters, many mum and dad landlords, and yet they're providing much better rental protections. Um, than we do here. Um, they have indefinite leases. They have longer um, periods of notification of the end of a lease. Um, I think it's typically three months. Um, they have uh, controls on the frequency of rental increases and the amounts of rental increases. And also um, tenants have a lot more say in whether they can do upgrades or um, have maintenance carried out in their properties. So we can't say a lot of that here. And I think coming um, back to Minister Jackson's point about home, I think that what we should be, when we compare ourselves to other places, we should be saying, well, um, are we providing the conditions in which people can make homes? And if we look at private rental now, you know, we've got people who can't find homes at all. We've got people who can't find appropriate homes. But even the people who have found appropriate homes are really afraid that they're going to lose them. They're afraid that they're going to be evicted or that they won't be able to pay the rent increase that's going to come with no notice and be as much as it needs to be. Um, so, yes, we can, we can do better and we can learn from other places. Um, I think that the, the division between home ownership and, and rental matters less than whether people are able to make homes in the houses and apartments that they live in. Yeah. Now, L, you've been on the national policy, urban urban policy, um, what's it called? Not task force. Not task force. Um, how can that policy and process possibly address in intergenerational inequities, which I know you're particularly interested in, face th that local communities face, and, and um, what do you think needs to be added to what you're doing now? What are the key next steps? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really good question. I think when we were um, talking earlier, Lucy, uh, the question that you posed is what's 
the Commonwealth role in, in all of this and, and should they be setting these policies from, from that level? And I think that, um, you know, this has been a really great exploration of all of the challenges that we face as a society and as a nation and I suppose being involved with the, um, the national urban policy and, and being part of the forum is about setting national standards and what it is that we are trying to solve and what our expectations are in terms of our future urban areas. So one of the objectives, which um, is the first objective, um, is that no uh, one or no place is left behind. So really that is all about equity and access to services, access to affordable housing, encompasses a lot of the things that we've been uh, talking about here tonight. And you know, what is the Commonwealth's role in making sure that that is implemented at a state and local level? Um, and I think that it's important that we are all working towards the same outcome and the Commonwealth, um, I suppose, uh, setting this initiative about these are the things that are really important to our urban areas and not only to um, housing outcomes, but also the communities that we uh, want to create and the places that we want people to be um, living in and have access to. And so um, the way that, I suppose, the implementation of uh, flows out is a really important part of the process. So um, there hasn't been any um, focus on that so much. Like obviously the team internally is thinking about what, um, how this is gonna be taken up at a state and local level, but it really needs to be um, a place-based approach and it needs to fit in with the needs of those local communities. And so setting these objectives at a Commonwealth level is important, um, but letting the states and letting the local government understand how they want to interact with that policy and what makes sense for them in terms of how it fits in with those strategies I think is really important. So one of the things and an example of, of how this is kind of um, rolling out is that the urban precincts and partnerships program and also the thriving suburbs funding that the Commonwealth Government is um, initiating will uh, be looked at through the lens of the national urban policy. So it will take into account equity and access for people and, and that ensuring that um, no one or no place is left behind. So it really sets a framework for assessment in terms of where the Commonwealth are going to invest their money and making sure that it takes into account equitable outcomes. And how does it fit in with the national housing policy to deliver, was it 200,000, um, 1.2 million homes over five years? How does it relate to that? Yeah, well, it um, certainly is uh, within the same portfolio and it's um, being, um, I suppose, that uh, the implementation and meeting those targets um, will uh, be assessed through the national urban policy. So those objectives will be used to um, set the targets and, and meet the targets in terms of where they're located, uh, making sure that good design and some of the outcomes that we've been talking about here are uh, assessed through the lens of the national urban policy. So they definitely work hand in hand. Very good. Rose, can I ask you to comment on that? Um, the other thing the Commonwealth can do is give us money. <laughs> um, so, yes, I mean, look, I think the work that is being... It's great to have a Commonwealth government that's interested and engaged in housing and cities, and that hasn't always been the case, and so it's fantastic to see um, the initiatives and the leadership, um, and, and I agree um, that a, the, the Commonwealth has been a really fantastic partner. A, a, as I said, I think the delivery is being done largely, um, and Elle El acknowledged that at a state and local level, and it needs to be, because those are levels of government um, that are uh, more skilled with program delivery. I mean, we do not want the Commonwealth actually managing the building of housing. They are not... Like, much love to my Commonwealth colleagues in Canberra, they are not experienced or set up to do that. Absolutely policy leadership, and that's the work that you're doing. Big tick, funding, big tick. Uh, vertical fiscal imbalance, it's a thing. It's a real thing. They have got considerably more resources than more resources than we have, and we've really appreciated their support, but, you know, that is a huge challenge for us. Um, so, you know, I think as I'm liking all three levels of love government working together, um, but I do think there's a huge urgency to the challenge here, and... I'm looking forward to having some great partners elected on September 14 at the local level, um, but we all need to get our skates on because uh, I do think um, we've set a number of 
important goals now and, and really we have to get on with delivering them. Mm. So it doesn't really relate to Sydney, but which doesn't really matter, but um, um, when my husband Malcolm was the Prime Minister, he developed this idea of a city deal, which where there was conspicuously one for West, the Western Sydney around the airport, but um, which is, you know, the airport's being built on time and on budget, which is fantastic. But there was another, you know, at the, actually at the last architecture biennale last year in um, Venice, um, the architects from Launceston who actually put together the content in the Australian Pavilion um, were discussing with us the impact of the city deal in Launceston. And they said that the city deal in Launceston where the university was a big part of it, the University of Tasmania, state government, local government and federal government actually transformed the way Launceston was working economically and in any, every other way. It was sort of like a coming together of all the key actors. Do you think there's scope to do that sort of thing in the various parts of New South Wales and Australia? I'll ask everybody. I mean, yes, I certainly do. I'd probably say Newcastle is a bit of an example of that, where we have the city of Newcastle um, as a large, functional, dynamic local government partner, certainly to the state. We've invested there, you know, for everything from our plans for Hunter Park and, you know, various kind of precinct renewals around the Newcastle area where there are substantial government land holdings, um, as well as things like the light rail, you know, that kind of in transport infrastructure investment that can only come from the state level. Um, and the Commonwealth's played an important role too, you know, imagining a future for the Hunter region with Newcastle as a centre that goes beyond exporting coal, which we know is not the future um, for that region and our country. So, you know, that's still in the pipeline, some of that work, but I think that is an example of where we have an amazing city with a great future ahead of it, but transformation needs to happen, and you do need that three-level alignment, and it's kind of working, actually. If people, if you haven't been to Newcastle recently, get there. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Um, comment on. Okay, so would anyone else like to comment on, on that, you know, how do governments, multi-layers of governments and key actors, like universities, for example, we're at a university now, how do they actually all work together to a, a better outcome? I think there's been some amazing examples in public transport recently. So I think the recent metro line that's opened, and um, I should know what the federal government's involvement was, if, if anybody, certainly state and local um, working together um, to deliver an incredible outcome there. It's a beautiful example of good design and how that wins over people's hearts and minds. I think it's, you know, it's this city-defining moments that also change the paradigm. I feel like when I was taking the metro recently, was everyone was smiling. And it's this sort of sense that we're kind of seeing our city in a way we've never really seen it before and we're suddenly seeing it as this sort of place of incredible potential. So, you know, perhaps what I want to say is the federal government should be pumping heaps of money into public transport because that's what's going to unlock heaps and heaps of other areas. Easy I, for I, th say. I think they are doing a lot in Western Sydney. I don't know, certainly the train line from St, Ma St Mary's North, but... On, on the whole, it doesn't invest in public transport. That should change. Yeah. But very much like it invested a lot in West Connects, I remember. Lots in roads. <laughs> in uh, ROADS. Yes, that's much easier to fund, I think. <laughs> Just reflecting on that example, I know that a lot of the, the work that I've been involved in in and around the Aerotropolis and all of the change that's happening from Penrith to Picton um, you know, was initiated through through that city deal. And one of the things that was embedded into that was the need to respond to country, community and culture. And so we've seen a really significant shift in the way that First Nations people and their knowledges are being embedded into the future planning, um, not only design, which is obviously important, but considering First Nations knowledges as they relate to planning and thinking about the Aerotropolis as a precinct. So, um, you know, the way that that filtered down was a commitment to recognise country in in the Aerotropolis precinct plan um, and a, a resulting chapter in the development control plan that really um, elevates traditional custodians knowledge um, basically in making sure that traditional custodians are technical partners in the process of planning in the Aerotropolis which I think is really a flow on from what was um, what was put into that city deal so I think that there's some real strength in getting on the same page across all of the different levels of government about what are we trying to achieve and how can we articulate those those goals clearly and, and there was some money on the table for livability you know like things like open space parks and there, I know one of the parks um, that's being built a public work in a park 
is being done by Janet Lawrence, who's actually a friend of mine, and she's working with a lot of Indigenous groups, local groups, and, you know, sort of experts, Indigenous experts on delivering public art. So that's a, a real example of collaboration with First Nations people and, I guess, a, a, a European background, um, art, great Australian artists working together to a good outcome. Um, can I ask you... Um, uh, uh, can I can I ask you, Hazel, for some comments on what we've been talking about? Sure. Um, I, I think that we've shown in New South Wales that we can do good placemaking, um, and we we do good placemaking when we invest in it properly, um, when there's political will behind it, um, and when there is the resources necessary to coordinate all of the moving parts that you need to create homes and neighbourhoods and the supporting infrastructure for those. I think the challenge is that it's very resource intensive to always do that well everywhere. And so even when we have specific placemaking interventions and we see, we see these excellent outcomes, which in themselves are excellent, we still have situations where other areas are, are left behind. So I think we need to think about how do we bring up the base as well as how do we innovate and, and provide um, excellence um, in, in highly resourced uh, developments. Okay. So I think I'll, I'll ask everybody the same question and then um, you, obviously you all answer the question if you, if, you, if you care to. You can go on strike if you like. But, and then I will ask for a couple of questions from the audience, okay? So the question is, if you had the power, um, what is the first thing to do you would do to address the housing crisis achievable in a two-year ministerial term? I might start with everybody, then finish with Rose, OK? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm happy to start. Uh, I think that it's really important for us to be thinking about different housing typologies as they relate to the needs of the communities that we're planning for and thinking about. So um, considering intergenerational housing and the fact that um, when, when I talk about culturally responsive housing, I'm not just referring to First Nations people and their needs, but we are working with and, and planning for communities that are culturally diverse, that want to live in different ways. So I think that we need to challenge some of our assumptions around um, the types of housing that we're delivering and the types of people that we're serving and think about ways that um, uh, kinship caring and cultural obligations to look after multi-generational families can be um, embedded into the design and delivery of different housing typologies. Okay, thank you. Mine's really easy. It's just get this pattern book out there. Oh, look, I agree. I, I wish it was out there, you know, 15, 20 years ago. There used to be one called Coastal Design Guidelines, which was done by UDAS, the Urban Design Advisory Service, which has wound up at some stage. Um, lots of things get wound up in government. That's the fun thing about government, especially in New South Wales. But, but UDAS did this fantastic book called Coastal Design Guidelines. And Chris Johnson knows this. He's in the audience because I got him to come up and help us. But there was a very... Um, the administrators were called in between 2005 to 2007. I was probably the... I would call myself the planning administrator because there was a complete you know, sort of local government inter sign war between what, you know, the pro-development people and the anti-development people and nothing was getting done. So we were called in and Chris helped us. And what um, often you would speak to developers or community members or lo fellow local government people or people working in the local government, the council officers, and you would say, well, you know, this place needs a bit of help, but you know, LEP was pretty hopeless and the DCP wasn't very clear. I said, but what would be really good is if we got some of these buildings. And, and once you showed them a picture, they go, oh, yeah, we can do that. But often, and it's a failure of leadership as well as much as it's a failure of anything else. If you don't give people a clear expectation, and management too, for that matter, if, if you don't give people a key expectation of what is expected of them, it is really hard to deliver it, really hard. Now... Hazel. Mine's an easy one. Yep. I'd, I'd put a cap on the frequency and amount of rental increases. Mm -hmm. Would that have a chilling effect on supply? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> I was just concerned when you said the ministerial term was two years. No, well, that was. That means point. I've only got six months left. No, 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 no. I think they mean the next election. Yeah, right. No. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it's a challenging question for me. What would I do? Um, invest five billion dollars on building new public housing, which I did. Um, so I tick that one. I, I definitely think. Thinking forward, thinking forward, deliver on that. I mean, it's great to have the money in the budget. Let's actually get the houses built, you know, along with the principles I articulated. But I do think, um, you know, that the next, it's not strictly within my portfolio area, but the next big piece, and there's so many pieces, um, is the legislative um, prohibition on no grounds eviction, which we have committed to doing and, you know, is part of what Hazel has described. Mm. Um, and I do think certainly that. That's not going to solve all of the challenges that she has correctly identified. It's an excellent um, first. But that's right. I, I do think fair cop, um, we've committed to doing it, and it is foundational to me that people in the rental market have more security than they have. So we've done a bit. That is the next piece that has got to fall into place, and I, I, I'm committed to working on that through the end of the parliamentary term this year. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's really, that's really important. I think the precariousness... The, of you know housing security that people who are renting have is just it's terrifying and the other thing you know like it's not going to happen in the next two years but if we could actually develop you know professionally like a real estate investment trusts for build to rent housing like they have in all the large cities around the world especially new york which i spend a lot of time in and a lot of these families are you know famous or maybe sometimes infamous like the trump family built its billions of dollars on building build-to-rent affordable housing, of which 30% is affordable housing, and it and it is funded by a tax credit introduced by, you wouldn't believe, Ronald Reagan. So we've got to get very smart about structuring the financial structure, financial composition of how housing is built with inducements and incentives that isn't just FSR bonuses, because that's what developers typically want, but actually do it at a much more basic kind of or basic or macroeconomic level is what I think needs to happen, as well as what everyone else has proposed. Thank you. So can we turn up the lights so I can see some faces? Please. Thank you. Um, <laughs> there you are. Thank you. That's good. Good to have humans. Um, um, can I please put, uh, ask people to put their hands up if they'd like to ask a question? Okay, Chris. I recognise him. Yep. Yes, I think somebody will bring you a microphone, yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks, Lucy. Uh, Chris Johnson, I think you raised this sort of issue I want to pick up on, and that is 95% of housing actually is done by the private sector in Australia and certainly in New South Wales and Sydney. Most of the discussion has been about the role of government and federal, state and local government, but we have to activate the private sector, incentivise whatever, to provide the range of housing that is needed. Uh, and I think, Minister, you're doing an incredible job for the social housing end of it and getting money in and doing all that, but I assume part of the housing portfolio is to get the rest of it, the other 95% sort of happening, and to get a good range across that. Uh, but I see that in your TOD developments, transit or developments, uh, there's no real uplift, but 15% has to be affordable forever. Uh, my understanding from the, my contacts in the development industry is nothing much will happen. Uh, so I'm just the question is how to properly and sensitively and economically understand the connection to the private sector to make sure that other 95% is done in a good way. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, I'm not responsible for the delivery of private market housing. Um, Minister Scully does that as the Minister for Planning. And it's certainly it's not necessary. I mean, government can be weird and dysfunctional. And so, uh, you know, just for the purposes of full disclosure, as the Minister for Housing, my responsibility is government subsidised housing. Um, private market housing is, 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 you know, led by Paul. That doesn't mean to say I'm not very, very interested in it. And look, you know... It, Unfortunately, I, I might say, or some, some might say, unfortunately, it's not 15% um, required across all the TODs in perpetuity. In some of the transport-oriented development areas, it's as low as 2 and as high as 15. And that's been done deliberately to provide flexibility to support the feasibility of projects, um, to, you know, allow the private market to respond. Um, 
I would say uh, I'm, Paul is very attuned to th the feasibility challenge. He knows that we can't just have um, planning rules. We need actual projects approved and those actual projects have to get built. He knows that. Um, but specifically, I am very defensive of the affordable housing component within the TODs. This is the first time we've done mandated affordable housing in government-led rezonings. They are big rezonings. These are valuable areas. There, there is money to be made in the housing market. I think we can all recognise that. And, you know, we, we, it, I don't think it is unreasonable to have some level of... That's what inclusive growth is. It's not just enough that we have more supply. We desperately need more supply. I'm, I'm in favour of it and I'm a vocal advocate of it. It's got to also be affordable supply. And so mandating affordable housing, you know, within the spread, I think it is a very important step that we've taken. But having said that, look, as I said, I know that Paul is very attuned to feasibility. I think one thing we, you know, there are some things that are out of our control, you know, the broader labour market dynamics, global supply chains, all of that. It, it's, it's, it's tough, I get that. Um, using our land, that's something that, you know, we're trying to do um, to, to get it moving. Um, and ultimately, my, 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 my comments to the private developers are always this, let's just have honest and open conversations, you know. I, I, I have to say, if, you know, if they come open book and we come open, you know, I, I think there is a way that we can build housing in New South Wales and it can be profitable for private market developers and deliver on the supply and affordability outcomes that we need. But everyone's got to come open to that conversation and I think we're getting there. Um, but I, I do think that's an important principle that would underpin um, those policy discussions. I might have a, um, a couple of comments on, on the Todd policy and, and the question as well. Um, one is, provided that the requirements for subsidised or affordable housing are made clear before the land is rezoned, yes. they should be reflected in the land price that the land is sold for. So it's not the developers who are purchasing the land and building the housing that we need who are mis missing out. It's the land owners who are going to be getting a slightly less large windfall on their land property. Um, the other thing that I, I wanted to take the opportunity to make the connection back to build to rent, because I think this is important and it's perhaps a bit missed in the story of the Todds. Um, one of the things that the Todds are going to do if we deliver the housing primarily as prim private housing is probably deliver a bunch of strata title buildings, which is my area. Now, strata title buildings, each individual apartment is owned by a different owner, which basically means what, your res what the result is, is you take a bit of land and you fragment that land into however many owners there are in a building. That makes redevelopment of that land incredibly difficult. So I think that when we're talking about TODs and what types of development we're providing in the most um, useful and valuable land, which is the land around the stations, we should actually be looking, well, can we be providing build to rent properties in those locations so that 50 years from now, when those properties need to be redeveloped, they can be because the land is owned by a single property owner. I, I thoroughly agree with that. I think that's going to be the key to there being, you know, like an ongoing production of, 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 of rental housing and affordable rental housing. And as repeat what I just said, 30% of rental accommodation built in New York is characterised as affordable housing, and that's a function of something below medium income in the relevant area, like Manhattan or something. And that has worked since the 1970s. And so even when these billionaire towers, these pencil towers are built and some apartments sell for $200 million or something crazy, still 30% of the dwellings are actually affordable. There are separate entries and stuff like that, but they still are a fundamental part of building any new housing. And I think, you know, from what I've spoken to the people who actually build it, not the Trumps, but other families, the tax credit is the critical ingredient that gets them to 30%. So that's why I'm challenging everybody really to think of new ways, not just inclusion rezoning or mandating a certain percent, because if you actually juice it up with tax credits, you can get there a lot faster. Which would be a federal government thing, Rose, just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, another question? Sorry. Sir, in the front? Yeah, I can see you now. Uh, g'day, John from Shelter, New South Wales, the National Shelter. Um, I'm interested in the concept of innovation 
I think we sometimes think about innovation is where you're prepared to fail. Just any examples that from anyone on the panel about co-ops, um, uh, foyers, common grounds, things that have worked that are really innovative, really interested to hear about something outside the standard response. Oh, our government is so sort of bad at failing in a way. I mean, we fail all the time. I, I, mean, I want to rephrase that. We fail all the time. We're good at failing. We're bad at being willing to fail. So government is so cautious sometimes and doesn't actually always do innovation well. Um, look, I mean, just off the top of my head, one area that is different and new and emerging and that we are looking to show a leadership role in is modern methods of construction. Um, you know, uh, modular homes. I mean, there's a bit of different views. Some people view it as one of those kind of housing policy cul-de-sacs that you're sort of constantly sort of caught in and it never really works. Maybe that's fair. But this is probably the example of leaning into it, being willing to fail a bit. I mean, I like the idea. Hey, you know, can we deliver quality homes built in a factory, get around that labour crisis for cheaper and quicker? We're desperate. There's an urgent need. Um, housing typologies, it responds fantastically to that because you can bolt on and, and create new spaces as grandparents need to move in and out and different kinship networks. There's a potential there. So that's an example of something that I'm not sure is going to work. Um, but I think it has some potential. I think there's some juice in that lemon and willing to lean into it a bit, willing to give it a go, um, see if it can be part of the suite of solutions. And hey, look, if it fails... Um, well, you know, we'll find something else, I guess. But yeah, government is actually very, very bad at trying things that might not work. <laughs> well, can I just um, give Philip Oldfield a bit of a plug on his... Where are you, Philip? Oh, he's over here, right over here. On his um, Twitter account, which is called X, thank you, Elon, um, he, you put up some fantastic, you know, sort of social housing which is built in other countries like Spain in Iran, which is not what many people would think of as being innovative in the supply of, um, um, you know, sort of worker housing. Other countries are doing it so well and we have this actual huge reluctance or disinterest, probably more accurately, in actually looking at other people, what other people are doing it and doing it. And modular and prefabricated construction, particularly for medium and high density, is very much becoming a very dominant thing in, this, in the North, in the Scandi countries too. And we just, now I don't know whether it's the structure of the construction industry, and I'm not going to go into anything topical, but, you know, it's the, it's the combination of large developers who are used to churning something out and, you know, large industrial, you know, on the worker side, maybe that stifles in, in, innovation and we need to actually be conscious of that and actually work against that natural risk-averse structure or outcome that you're talking about, Rose. Other. I was just thinking there's a... I mean, just at the other end of the scale from big policy and the rest, there's a quite fantastic little project that was delivered a few years ago by NMBW Architects in Melbourne, which is social housing or um, public housing. And essentially they delivered... Hard to do, actually, here because of some of the controls we have, but... They essentially delivered just um, quite simple bare sort of shell apartments, but they were designed so that the people who were living there who were mostly um, high needs could fit them out how they wanted to. And so it was really fascinating to see the range of different ways that that was done, that different people lived together. Um, so th that would be a project worth worth looking into. I could tell you a bit more about it after well, afterwards. Yeah, yeah, love to, Rose, yeah. <laughs> Um, I think another example that um, I can throw in the mix is that I'm on the board of Mission Australia and we've actually just released a new youth foyer in Townsville, uh, which is an incredible way to meet young people's needs, you know, in terms of them transitioning into more secure housing and walking alongside them in a particular um, place um, that they find themselves. And I think a really important part of that is also the wraparound services as well. So it's not necessarily just about the housing, but it's all of the support that we provide those young people and um, really have a commitment to transitioning them into more stable housing on the other side. So I think that those types of models are really important to be thinking about in this state as well, because we have um, such a, a huge need in um, housing for our young people and models that really are designed to fit for them um, and make sense at that particular part of their life cycle, I think is really important. 
Okay, other questions? One, sir, you next to Chris. Gosh, there's a real cluster here of questioning for Paul. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy. Minister Rose, thank you for bringing out there's a little bit of juice left in the lemon. <laughs> and you come from Rockdale. You know the culture is really, really important for housing. Over 30% of the population in our state did you come from different multicultural backgrounds. How is housing going to incorporate the cultural values to make sure that each culture is recognized? When we look at the pattern books, Chris did 20 years ago, another pattern book design guidelines. One of the things we find where we have a great asset in the culture of our country, housing, is not really reflecting a lot of that culture. How are you going to bring this, the culture in homes of people? So people like that family you mentioned from Vietnam, they feel proud that the culture is now the integral part of their living and breathing the society and the social infrastructure. Well, I can comment more sp most specifically in relation to the delivery of our public housing program, social housing program. Um, uh, and, you know, all, all I can say is that we, ha through the creation of our new agency, Homes New South Wales, one of the core purposes of that was to be tenant-led, people-led. So we had this situation previously where we had DCJ housing, which looked after the people who lived in public housing over in one department, and the Land and Housing Corporation, which delivered the actual physical structure over in another department of government. I mean, as you can see from my comments, I consider that to be ludicrous. So we brought it together, and a key purpose of that was listening to and reflecting the values, the ideas, the aspirations of the people who live in our, in our homes, um, the tenants of the New South Wales government, um, in the way that we deliver and plan our housing. And um, a key part of that is obviously First Nation leadership and co-design. Um, and we have a very good um, partnership with the Aboriginal Housing Office, which is a dedicated standalone uh, agency with its own legislative um, basis and board. Um, and, and they have incredible First Nations leadership and we collaborate with them with all of our work. But absolutely, ev everyone who is part of um, Homes New South Wales, you know, we value um, and want to elevate and listen to their voice. So for, for us, um, as government housing um, delivery, um, th those principles that you have described, drawing on all of those perspectives are, are core business for us. And, and that can include everything from the way that we do community development and have, you know, local tenant groups and, you know, support resident voices to the way homes are designed. As I said, you know, we, we accept that we need to have flexibility in, in housing design and typology. Everything from, you know, a small studio that might suit a single elderly person who's keen to just have a discreet, neat roof over their head um, to a family home with a granny flat, you know, that, and everything in between um, to reflect the different needs of people. So for us, that's core business. But um, I, and I, I probably, I don't know if there's any kind of reflections on that in terms of the development of the pattern book, but... Um, you, you might want to add if that's something that's been taken into account. I think it's such a, an important point. Thank you for making it. Um, yes, in the, I suppose in the sense that we are going through a process of developing the patterns and we are doing um, consultation with communities to really understand what's important. Um, interestingly, the one of the big things that, that, that came out of that consultation was master bedrooms with en suites are really important. So we go. So we've got some work to do there, but um, but the the thing of the the degree to which you can make your uh, your house your home, um, and how that reflects you know who you are and and where you come from and your cultural values, I think is is super important, and we will absolutely have to think about that very carefully with the patterns, and certainly with the patterns, the idea isn't that there's one, you get that or nothing. You know, there's the the intention is that there are a range and that they would suit different people, you know, and, and provide different levels of flexibility. We're, we're on the, right on the, you know, the edge of it, so we're really looking forward to working with the teams on what those patterns are. So, yeah, thank you. It's a really, really provocative comment. Thank you very much. Now, I think, I think we're sort of on the, trying to keep to the time clock. 
Can I please ask Hannah to come up and give a final few words um, about about what the work that the university, et cetera, is doing? Thank you very much, Hannah. Thanks, Lucy. Um, and thank you to this exceptional panel of very strong female thinkers in this space. I'm Hannah Belitho, and I'm with the UNSW Cities Institute. And tonight's discussion and event is really precisely what our new institute, or fairly new institute, is about. We're, we're an institute that was set up to explore different ways of working with academia, bridging ideas with research and policy and practice. Um, so to that end, um, most of our team are, in fact, practitioners and policy makers, and we draw on existing research across UNSW um, from centres like City Futures, where Hazel um, is positioned, who really provide us with much of the um, evidence we need to facilitate better practice um, as an outcome of research. So I really want to start by thanking Hazel for your um, deep knowledge and housing um, thoughts tonight. We are also a cross-discipline think tank which brings people together. Um, everyone in this space really works in vertical silos and we've talked about this a little bit earlier before the event started. We've got business, government, portfolios, we've got university faculties, we've got research centres within university faculties, but today's problems around cities are really cross-discipline. They're horizontal and they need to cross all of the silos. So that's part of the reason that the, city, the Cities Institute exists here. Um, we're led by Peter Poulet, who unfortunately couldn't be here today because he has COVID, previous government architect and Greater Cities Commissioner. We're supported by a really distinguished um, city thought leaders, team of thought leaders in our external advisory panel. And our newest exciting addition is Dylan Compamere, who's come on board with us as the City's Institute Professor of Practice, and also while he's working still as Principal Architect at the Government Architects. So he's sort of a really good example of how the Institute is working, our method of working, our method of collaborating and partnering with industry and government. So it was really great to have Olivia here tonight, thank you, um, to talk about all of the pattern book work and it's great to be partnering um, as an academic organisation with that government organisation. Thank you. <laughs> um, so a key sort of recurring theme tonight um, was around equity and the role of housing in equity and the role of housing in creating healthy communities. Our team has a very strong public health focus. We know that the main determinants for health, um, of the main determinants for health, genetics really only contribute to about 10% of the disease. Um, the environment and housing contributes to the rest. That's 90% that we can all collectively work to alter. So I really want to thank Lucy Turnbull for being here tonight as well and for your leadership over many, many years in that space around healthy cities and how we, um, and how we bring communities together. Thank you for your contribution tonight. The other key theme we really heard about was about, um, was around country and uh, where house, the issue of housing supply fits in a broader conversation around country. And I just want to call out Ellie and say thank you for travelling down from the far north coast today to give your um, knowledge and insights and to further her sort of call for arms that I've heard her talk to in quite a few presentations now um, for a future governance system that gives power to traditional custodian, custodians in a context where there's no legislative voice. So thanks for coming down and contributing. So what then is the role of an organisation like the Cities Institute or academia more generally in all of this? Our institute sort of is effectively an intermediary. Strategically, we sit next to and accompany partners to support community-determined outcomes. And key to this is really understanding whose voice counts and the importance of multiple, multiple knowledge systems. 
And the strength of this way of working is really critical and it's why our institute exists. So, to finish um, off, because this is the last thing between all of you and a drink, is to, to say thank you again to all the speakers. And I also want to call out Phil Oldfield, the Head of School for Built Environment, for your leadership in the Utsun event, and for supporting the City's Institute vision for this event as well, um, which was really around showcase, showcasing strong, wise voices and cross-discipline expertise. We did a little bit of digging and we actually think this might be the first housing panel in New South Wales which features all female leaders. So we're quite proud of that at the Cities Institute. <laughs> I'm also proud to say that the Cities Institute team is in fact 70% women, 20% First Nations and 40% from culturally diverse backgrounds. <laughs> And then I just want to also give particular thanks to the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Archi Arts Design and Architecture, Claire Annesley, for her insights and her really strong leadership grounded in her research on gender and governance. And then, of course, <laughs> of course, to Minister Jackson, Minister for Housing and Water and Homelessness and Mental Health and Youth and for the North Coast. It's a true exemplar of cross-discipline expertise. <laughs> and we're really thrilled that she could be here tonight with us because it really represents a government that's willing to discuss and take on the challenge of creating better, more healthy, equitable cities, as has already been evidenced by your big investment in social housing. And we just, we really look forward to collaborating with all of you um, on the challenges facing our cities as we move forward. Um, but for now, please join us in the foyer for a drink and thank you all for coming. <laughs>